Welcome to Cincy Reformed. I'm Pastor Brandon. Join us with Pastor Zach. Zach is a is the pastor at Westside Reformed Church, a URC congregation in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm the church planting pastor of Christ Reformed Church, a URC church plant in Florence, Kentucky. Today we wanted to talk about uh, one of the great fathers of of the Reformed faith, um, and it's a guy named Guido Debray. And many of you uh, who are in the Reformed Church might rec- recognize that name. He w- uh, was the author of the Belgic Confession. Uh, now, there were probably others who contributed and helped out as well, but uh, he is the main central kind of a- author of the, uh, of the Belgic Confession, the confession that the churches of the URC look to, we subscribe to. We believe that the Belgic Confession is a great summary of, uh, of what the Bible is teaching. And there's 37 articles, and I would encourage you to go and read the Belgian Confession. Uh, it, it is a beautiful summary of the Christian faith. Uh, but we wanted to spend time today not so much talking about the Belgian Confession, but we wanted to talk about Guido de Bray himself, uh, because it might, he might not be somebody that you're familiar with. Maybe you know that he wrote the Belgic, but in terms of who he was or what he did or what happened to him, you might not be fully aware. Um, also in the show notes page, I'll include uh, a few books, um, both for adults and children, uh, that tell his story. And it might be a book that you might want to grab to learn more about him. But I wanted to give a bit of a historical sketch um, one, one place I will recommend is that Danny Hyde has written a commentary on the Belgic Confession, and he has given a great um, in, introductory chapter to the life of Guido de Bray um, in chapter one of that commentary. So I would recommend that, and again, that will also be in the show notes page. But uh, just to kind of kick us off, I'll, I'll begin with his early years. Um, Guido de Bray was born in 1522, so this is a few years after Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of Castle Church in Wittenberg, but he's born in Mons, which is now in southern Belgium. He was the fourth son, born of devout Roman Catholic parents. Uh, His father was a worker of stained glass, and... um, uh, Debray actually became an apprentice under him working on how to stain glass. Uh, Debray's mother prayed that God would do mighty things through him. Uh, in fact, one of her prayers, she said, My God, if it could be that you could give me such a child, and perhaps it could be the child that I now carry to preach thy word. And that was a prayer that her mother, that his mother rather, uh, remembered praying over him as he was as he was born. And around uh, 25 years of age, Guido de Bray became a Protestant after hearing preachers uh, whom had been sent by John Calvin to preach the gospel. And uh, de Bray was called into Protestant ministry. And as he reflected on his mother's prayer for him, he said, "He gave me more than you asked for." In order to make me a true imitator of Jesus, the Son of God, I was called to the holy ministry, not to preach the doctrines of man, but the pure, simple word of Jesus and his apostles. So that kind of um, is a good survey, I think, of his, of his early years. Uh, but he's going to go through, you know, as, as he lives, and now, now that he's a Protestant, and there's, uh, especially during this time period, uh, during the Reformation and post-Reformation, there's going to be a lot of clashes between the Protestants and the Roman Catholics. Some of the areas that he's ministering to are not going to be very safe. And so you're going to notice as we uh, continue through his life story, he uh, undergoes various exiles. So, Zach, maybe you can talk about his first exile. Yeah, well, when Debray was uh, 25 years old, that's in uh, 1547, he's in his home city of Mons, and there were a couple of Reformed ministers that uh, were passing through. They were traveling from Geneva to, to England, and as they were passing through, they were arrested by some Franciscan monks. And, um, you know, we oftentimes think about monks as being, you know, chummy fellows that have had a couple beers or something like that. 
Uh, but these um, monks must have had a couple too many beers, and they decided that they were going to ar arrest these two uh, Reformed ministers. This is not Debray, by the way. But they arrested them, and they told people that these ministers had the devil inside of them. They burned them at the stake, and then those two uh, men died um, singing Psalm 6, one of the great penitential psalms. Within the um, within the Bible, uh, that event was uh, very um, uh, significant because it signified that the Reformed churches and Reformed Christians were officially coming what was called then under the cross, and by what that meant uh, is a way of saying uh, being under the cross is a way of saying being under persecution, and the persecution was really uh, ramping up against the uh, Reformed churches and against Reformed believers. And that um, drove uh, Debray then in the next year to leave his hometown, to travel to London, and to find uh, safety there. And that became then his first uh, exile away from his homeland. He uh, joined a Protestant congregation there that was uh, uh, French-speaking, and it was a uh, refugee congregation with other like-minded, you know, refugees who had fled uh, persecution from his homeland. And that's where he began uh, training for the ministry because, as you could probably imagine, there were a number of people take, uh, fl fleeing from um, that area and other areas uh, on the continent, finding refuge in London, a very important city right across the English Channel. And then he had opportunity then to interact with theologians pastors who were all congregating there uh, before they'd be able to return to their uh, motherland to minister uh, the gospel. So that, thus far about his first uh, exile, and that uh, happened until about 1552. He's been there about four or five years in London. So his first ministry opportunity is in the Netherlands in Lille. Uh, so again, in 1552 onward into 1556 is going to be this first ministry opportunity. Again, he began training for the pastorate in London. But the problem is, Bloody Queen Mary comes to the throne in England, and Debray has to flee. Um, has to flee London, and he goes back to a persecuted area near Mons, where he grew up. And there he's going to do ministry, and he's going to travel around for about four years, preaching and traveling in secret. And so this is not going to be um, kind of a laid-back pastorate or an open pastorate, for that matter. This is more of one that's done in secret. Again, a lot of traveling, but it also afforded him a time to write. So he began writing books. He wrote the book, uh, The Staff of the Christian Faith. And the book was sentences from the Bible as well as from the Church Fathers, showing that the Reformed faith, um, from the standpoint of faith and doctrine, was in line with the ancient Church, uh, not the Roman Catholic Church. And so I think that this is a, an important thing to note about the Reformation. Uh, the Reformation was not a revolution that just wanted a brand new thing. Um, you know, they were not saying, well, I don't like my grandpa's faith. I want something new. It wasn't like that. They wanted the historic faith. They wanted the, uh, the faith once for all delivered to the saints in the hand of the apostles. And so what, what Debray is, is showing is that the Reformed faith is in line with the Bible, primarily, but also it's in line with the apostles and those who came after the apostles into the church fathers, that there's continuity, and that if anybody's deviated, it's been the Roman Catholic Church. They deviated not only from the Bible, but they deviated from the church fathers themselves in developing new doctrines and going in new directions uh, that were unfaithful to Scripture. Uh, Debray said, Let us rejoice in this, that we hold the true ancient doctrines of the, uh, the prophets, apostles, and the doctors of the church. And there he's speaking about the, the early church fathers. And so that was his first pastorate. Again, um, uh, he's, he's moving um, underground for about four years, but he's able to do some writing and some good polemic work, um, really showing uh, that the Reformed faith is rooted in Scripture and in the Christian tradition. In 1556, uh, Debray then 
had to flee from that uh, underground ministry and into what's called his second exile. And this uh, began then in the city of, of Frankfurt, so Germany. He um, was being persecuted, fled there, and pretty soon after that, he was able to uh, come into contact with the ministry of John Calvin, who visited that city and the uh, Dutch uh, refugee congregation that was worshiping there. Um, sometime after that, he then traveled from uh, Frankfurt to uh, Geneva, and he then took up and continued and furthered his studies in Geneva, uh, wanting to learn then from uh, John Calvin, who had visited in uh, Frankfurt, and also to learn from uh, Theodore Beza. And so that's the time when um, uh, Calvin, you could say, became a, a sort of a spiritual father to uh, Debray, which also then uh, demonstrates why then the confession that uh, Brandon mentioned earlier, the Belgian confession, that uh, Debray, um, of which it was the prime, he was the primary author, uh, then is so uh, near to Calvin's thoughts and to the French confession that uh, he had written. But um, there's really that, that connection then occurs there and why the uh, Belgic really carries on that uh, legacy uh, of John Calvin. So after, after uh, Guido de Bray's exile in Geneva, he enters a kind of second ministry period in the Netherlands in a city called uh, Tournai. And it was in 1559 when de Bray married Catherine Ramon, and he returned to the Netherlands, again, the city of Tournai, which is actually today in modern Belgium. Uh, the persecution, again, is high. So he's going, again, to another, another ministry, um, a pastorate, a, 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 another opportunity to spread the gospel. But again, it's in a very persecuted uh, way. He's meeting in secret. And, and in fact, the government would not allow large meetings. So they had to meet with 6 to 12 people in these like dinner parties. So the people would invite him over for dinner. He'd preach to this small group. Uh, he actually went by the name Jerome because he didn't want the Roman Catholics making any, any connections. Uh, and so again, a lot of this is, is done under, under the shadows a bit, um, going house to house, having dinner parties. And it was actually in Tournai when uh, Debray began writing the Belgic Confession of Faith. Uh, Godfrey Van uh, Vingren would have helped him um, actually edit the Confession of Faith. And in 1559, um, actually somebody sent a copy of the Belgic Confession to John Calvin to get his thoughts on the Belgic Confession. Um, at the time, he didn't know why we would want to write a new one because the French Confession was out and, th and there were some really good Reformed Confessions. And so he kind of pointed them to the French Confession. And of course, you know, as Pastor Zach mentioned, um, the Belgic Confession really used a lot of the French Confession and um, Calvin's Institutes. And so uh, a lot of those insights are already on display in the Belgic. Uh, so Calvin kind of pointed them to say, well, maybe look at the French Confession, but for political reasons, it just wasn't able to happen. They had to really write their own. They had to have a Belgic Confession. And so Calvin gave his blessing to the Belgic Confession of Faith. But Debray's ministry in Tournai was really incredible in terms of his teaching and of his, of, of his preaching. Uh, in fact, they think that nearly half the town was reformed. Um, nearly half the town was secretly becoming reformed and uh, largely due to the ministry of Guido de Bray. Um, and actually in their opposition to the Roman Catholic, Catholic Church, the, the townspeople started becoming very emboldened and they would actually go publicly with neighboring towns singing the Psalter in the streets. So it was, a, it was an act of defiance against the Roman Catholic Church, singing the Genevan Psalter. Uh, then in, 15, uh, yeah, in 1561, the Belgic Confession was uh, publicly um, distributed in the streets, which led to uh, troops being sent in to quell an uprising. So it was causing quite a stir. 
it, it's interesting that the Belgian Confession was almost being used as like gospel tracts almost. Just you know, handing out these thick gospel tracts of, of the Belgian Confession. Uh, but it's causing this uprising. People are reading the Belgic. They're liking the Belgic. It's a faith that uh, they've never seen before. Uh, they're seeing that it's, it's biblical. They're seeing that it's in line with the church fathers. And they're very aware that that was not anything that they were getting from the Roman Catholic Church. And so, again, very excited, causing this uprising. Uh, Debray um, hoped that the, conf- the, the confession would... Maybe calm some of the fears, because I think within the Roman Catholic Church, they were looking out at what was happening with the Lutherans, with the Reformed, and there were some who were wondering, you know, is this Reformed faith dangerous to the magistrate, for example? Um, Is the Reformed faith kind of like those Anabaptist radicals, or... Or, you know, where, where do they land, basically? And so Guido de Bray actually hoped that his confession would maybe calm down some of the, the fears that the Reformed were going to be this Anabaptist radical sect or movement. Um, but no, I think uh, the, the Belgian Confession, again, eager to express our, 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 common, our, our commonality in terms of, of the Trinity and, and so on and so forth. Um, but the persecution continued, uh, and in 1562, uh, they found the secret home of Guido de Bray, uh, and they found over 200 copies of the Belgian Confession in his home. They found books of the Reformers, uh, Luther, Zwingli, Bucer, Bullinger, Calvin, uh, but they didn't find Guido de Bray. He had eluded the Roman Catholic authorities, and he goes into a third exile. I'm the exile guy tonight, I guess. Yes. So, yeah, he uh, he fled and became a bit of a sojourner during his next exile from 1561 to 1566. And as he did that, he went to different places, and he then uh, served uh, primarily uh, French speakers, uh, Huguenots, to uh, minister to them. And as Brandon mentioned, the uh, Anabaptist issue was big. It's It's worth just noting on that topic that... In our day, when we think about Anabaptism, we're oftentimes thinking about uh, Amish or uh, Mennonites, uh, people who live a pacifist life and who um, just kind of withdraw from uh, ordinary society and live on their own and uh, just kind of keep to themselves. But that was not the uh, perspective on Anabaptism and the, the reality of Anabaptism at this time. But uh, they were actually quite the opposite. Rather than like just withdrawing quietly and peaceably from society, they uh, were more given to a revolutionary, uh, a revolutionary spirit of overthrowing uh, towns and rejecting the authority of the civil magistrates, um, forming their own societies, believing that they were going to bring in a millennial kingdom. And that kind of a revolutionary spirit that um, rejected the uh, civil government was why then it was so important for the reformers, whether Lutheran or um, reformed, to distance themselves from those groups. And so it was then during that this uh, third exile that uh, Debray wrote another book called The Rise, Spring, and Foundation of the Anabaptists. So again, wanting to make sure it's clear that these were um, lowercase c Catholic Christians who were um, standing in continuity with the ancient church, and that they were not uh, radicals that were seeking to overthrow anything, but that they were holding instead fast to the uh, church handed down uh, throughout the generations. So thus far, his uh, third exile. And after his third exile, he has a third and what will be his final ministry opportunity in the Netherlands, this time in Antwerp. In 1566, uh, he goes back to the Netherlands to be a minister. And this third ministry, this this year really of 1566, is known as the Wonder Year. 
because support was really growing for the Reformed churches. The things were beginning to spread, uh, roots were being um, d- uh, roots were being grown, and it was during this year that uh, people started again becoming more and more emboldened. Large c- crowds, they said. Uh, maybe even as large as 25,000 came out to hear Guido de Bray preach. And again, that seems like a lot of people, but uh, Guido de Bray said uh, he, he contributed the excitement uh, to the long famine of those words of the gospel of the Lord. In other words, people had languished in darkness under Roman Catholicism uh, in a very legalistic, um, religious system of indulgences and so on, no gospel, and there was this famine in the land, and now the the spring waters were coming uh, in, in terms of the gospel was now being preached. And so he said that that's why there's so much excitement, and that's why 25,000 people are coming out to hear me preach. Uh, that same year in 1566, the nobles aligned themselves with the Reformed faith, which was a big move in terms of political protection and also some... Uh, normalcy, you're not, uh, you know, if, if a noble is willing to kind of get behind you, you're not kind of the weird guy on the sidelines anymore. You're now more mainstream, more main line, more out there and normal and not, uh, and, and not weird. And so some of these nobles are aligning themselves and they wanted independence from Spain uh, that had a lot of dominance over there in terms of Roman Catholicism and power and so on. Uh, But actually in 1567, King Philip declared the city to be an open rebellion against the king and against the Roman Catholic Church. They laid siege to the city. Uh, Debray again managed to escape, but he had a brief pause at a hotel and somebody recognized him there. And he was arrested on April the 11th, 1567. And after he was arrested, Guido Debray said... And as for my chains and my bonds, rather than frightening me and filling me with horror, on the contrary, they are my delight and my glory. I count them more precious than chains of gold. They are more profitable to me. And when I hear the sounds of my chain, it seems that I hear the sound of sweet music in my ears. Not that it comes naturally from these bonds, but from the cause for which I am held, which is the holy word of God. Remember that I did not fall into the hands of my adversaries by mere chance, but through the providence of my God, who controls and governs all things, the least as well as the greatest. So Guido de Bray was hung on May 31st, 1567 in front of City Hall, And his official crime was celebrating the Lord's Supper against the Regent's Orders. Uh, Any closing thoughts about that? Well, I certainly hope that um, our listeners are inspired by that. And a man who did not only write good words, but uh, confessed them um, immediately before his martyrdom. Uh, I think it's helps us to understand why then the you know the truths that he fought for um were you know so powerful because they you, they can uh, support us in the face of death and that's really the kind of christianity that um i hope that our listeners are, are seeking uh, not something that is you know just some sort of a you know moralistic therapeutic kind of a religion, but a, a faith that actually has some um, substance to it and that do, does impact people uh, in real life and in real death. And we see this kind of thing when we read the Belgian Confession itself and the, the words from it. It's, it's a text that does not sound um, dry and detached from real life, but it's a text that's demonstrates throughout that it's very familiar with human suffering and that the biblical teaching, the scriptures have a lot to say about human suffering and about uh, human uh, joy in Jesus. And so I think that it's really um, uh, fascinating this many years later to to think about 450 years later-ish uh, a man who um, experienced so much uh, rejection, 
also you could say to some degree ministerial success <laughs> um, and then ultimately martyrdom uh, having such a hand in a, a document that has certainly you know, inspired me and many others to uh, you know, better understand the, the heart of Jesus Christ and the um, teaching of God's holy word but um, yeah, I, I hope so. I hope that's been helpful to, to our listeners. Yeah, I also like you know it's, it's interesting how they kind of uh, hone in on the Lord's Supper, and you know, um, it, it's interesting as we think back to the Reformation, we we mo- we more readily maybe think about justification. Mm-hmm. You know, that was a big debate, and it was a key debate, and maybe even one of the one of the centerpieces of the entire debate. Uh, but what's so interesting is that more ink was spilled on the Lord's Supper yeah. than justification by faith alone. And it's, it's interesting to us today that, you know, his crime here, celebrating the Lord's Supper. Yeah. Um, and in so many of our churches in, in, in America, we just kind of relegate the Lord's Supper. Yeah. It, is, um, it is so minimized and stripped of so much of the richness that the Bible and uh, the fathers gave it. And, um, and even in, in, the, in the Reformation, the Lord's Supper was a huge deal. And it was the reason that the Lutherans and the Reformed couldn't join forces. That was the one thing. Uh, agreed on everything. But when it came to the Lord's Supper, that was so important uh, that we can't just say, well, who cares? Well, God cares, and we care, and the church cares. And uh, so I, I think just it's, it's a great reminder that sacraments are not some sideline thing that nobody cares about, but they are a, a, a huge part of our faith and our piety. And how many people would be willing to die about the uh, over the Lord's Supper and be martyred for that in, in our day, right? Uh, yeah. To your point about uh, people being ready to marginalize that and right. get rid of that so so quickly because it's not practical or something. Yeah. But, we hope this has been a helpful uh, episode for you, uh, perhaps a little bit out of the ordinary, but certainly important to think about some of the forefathers and foremothers in the Christian faith whose legacy uh, guides us, instructs us, and uh, inspires us to go forward. Um, so until next time, this is Pastor Brandon, Pastor Zach, and we thank you for joining us for this episode of the Cincy Reform Podcast. To give us a good review on the podcast platform you're using, if you wouldn't mind, that'd be helpful to us. And we hope you join us again next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.